everyone. Welcome to episode number 540 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. My friends, are you ready? Because this week we're talking about photonics. We're talking about lasers. We're talking about photonic electronic integration. My guest is Dr. Adam Carter, CEO of OpenLight. And we're investigating on-chip optical amplification in LiDAR applications. How silicon photonics and LiDAR can be combined to create an integrated system and why Adam believes there is a growing need for greater photonic electronic integration. Also this week, keeping with our laser-filled theme, I check out a new experimental laser therapy that was able to boost short-term memory. But first, let's bring in OpenLight CEO, Dr. Adam Carter to Fish Fry. Hi, Adam. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Okay. So first off, Adam, Why do you think there is a growing need for greater photonic electronic integration? I think there are three main reasons. The first is higher pixel count as far as uh, LiDAR is concerned, lower power consumption, and of course, what all customers like, which is a reduced cost. But if you look at it from a LiDAR point of view, it's particularly long range LiDAR. It needs around greater than 200 meters of range. And if you look at that from a view of flight time for the light to the object and back, you get less than 750,000 points per second per channel. Now, if you take that and divide that by 10 frames a second, you get less than 75,000 pixels resolution. If you want a good image for the majority of the applications, they need around about half a million plus pixels. So therefore, you need multiple channels running in parallel. This increases power consumption and cost. So integration enables you to get better power consumption and to scale the cost accordingly. So Adam, why do you think more LiDAR customers are adopting PICS and on-chip optical amplification? Before we discuss that, let's look at an alternative approach to what silicon photonics with on-chip amplification gets you. If you do things without on-chip amplification, a customer will buy an optical amplifier die to boost the laser power to enable the greater than 200 meter range and a silicon photonics die with coherent receivers. In manufacturing to make the system, they would spend basically an hour to optically align the two of those pieces together with their laser. And then they have a one channel LIDAR system. If you look at what they would need then for their next generation, they might need to increase to 10 channels or higher for a higher pixel count. Now they would need to align 10 optical amplifier dies to one very small silicon photonics die. And that is not easy to do in a manufacturing environment. So they don't now spend 10 hours. It can now take 20, 30, or 40 hours, depending on the number of channels that you have. And if one of those alignments fails to one of those channels, they have to scrap the whole part. Now, if you imagine that you make a very small silicon photonics die with the optical amplifiers integrated into the silicon itself, when you look at this chip with your eye and it's very small, you can't even tell that the optical amplifiers are contained within the silicon. And that is what OpenLight offers. So a photonic integrated circuit with on-chip amplification makes it simple to add more channels. You can start with four channels for a prototype and scale up to 32 channels in the next generation by creating extra copies of the same design block on the chip. And in the silicon electronics industry, this is basically called step and repeat. The chips are silicon and mechanically robust compared to standalone optical amplifier dies. And most electronic assembly houses can handle these silicon chips. The main advantage, though, is the coupling losses are four times lower using the silicon waveguides and on-chip optical amplifiers compared to using an external optical amplifier die with spot size converters. So therefore, the key advantages are really lower cost, 
when you consider back-end manufacturing assembly, lower power consumption as the coupling losses are better, and ease of scaling to higher channel count as you copy and paste the cell and send the new layout to the foundry. So, Adam, let's talk more about the combination of silicon photonics and LiDAR. How can these two technologies be combined to create an integrated system? Well, LiDAR measures the distance of an object using a laser, an amplifier, and an optical detector. Many of the new applications for LiDAR involve mapping objects and environments, require increased component count, whether in front of a car or for machine vision for factory automation. Silicon Photonics uses high-volume tools developed to make a computer and smartphone chips to make optical waveguides on a silicon wafer. So it seems natural that LiDAR manufacturers would turn to silicon photonics to reduce the cost and now use silicon photonics with on-chip optical amplifiers as the channel count scales to enable them to get the high pixel count at the ranges that they need. Okay, so tell me more about open light. Now, you guys have some really cool integrated photonic solutions. Yeah, so open light was spun out of Juniper Networks just over a year ago. And the real value proposition of OpenLight is we're the first independent company to offer an open PDK at our chosen foundry partner, which is Tower Semiconductor. That PDK, nobody has done that previously, but our PDK differs because it adds the active elements into that PDK. We hold nothing back. Our business model is we can either do designs for you and then transfer that design into Tower, or if you have a silicon photonics team, you can access our PDK, design the chip yourself, and port it directly into Tower. On certain components, as we're developing them, we also offer early access ability. So, for example, on the semiconductor optical amplifiers, we're offering early access to our customers, particularly in the LiDAR space, who want to incorporate those active elements into their current designs. Fantastic. Now, you guys have a new design kit sampler to help with component testing, right? That's correct. So that really is to really give customers confidence in the models that are used in the simulation tools for our PDK. So for example, every element, whether it be passive or active is included in that PDK sampler. So it's a chip with one of everything on. And what that enables customers to do is to actually probe each of those components, measure the response of those components, and then compare it to the models in the PDK to give them confidence before they then go on and then design a fully integrated photonic circuit. Great. All right, Adam. Well, that's all I have for the normal questions, but it's time for your off the cuff. So, Adam, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the planet, you need a passport to get there or the restaurant is closed, what would you have? So my favorite restaurant is actually Merriman's in Kapalua on on Maui. And it's a very nice ambiance. You can sit outside looking over Kapalua Bay as the sun goes down. So my favorite meal would be to eat there. And it's typically usually some sort of fish dish. That sounds absolutely wonderful, Adam. I want to go there right now. (laughs) Awesome. Well, this has been super cool. Thank you so much for joining me, Adam. Thank you very much. So let's talk about how lasers can improve cognitive function. So get this, a team of researchers from the University of Birmingham in the UK and Beijing Normal University have developed a new non-invasive laser therapy that has been shown to improve short-term memory. So the technology at the heart of this new research is what is called transcranial photobiomodulation, or TPBM. And it changes the activity in the brain by delivering light photons through the skull. According to this research, TPBM has been shown to improve brain function in a wide range of neurological and psychiatric disorders and memory enhancement in age-related cognitive decline. 
So this study first enlisted 90 subjects, both male and female, and then applied this laser light therapy to the right prefrontal cortex of the brain. This portion of the brain is especially important because it plays a critical role in short-term memory. So this team wanted to work on this part of the brain first. The researchers tried a variety of different methods when it came to the actual laser treatment. Some patients were treated with a laser light at wavelengths of 1,064 nanometers, and some were treated with shorter wavelengths. And some other patients had treatment delivered to the left prefrontal cortex instead of the right. All of the patients were also treated with a sham laser treatment to rule out a placebo effect as well. After only 12 minutes of treatment, the patients in this study were asked to carry out a series of memory tasks. They were asked to remember the colors or orientations of a set of items on a screen. And get this, the subjects that received the laser therapy at wavelengths of 1,064 nanometers performed at a higher level, remembering on average 2.1 objects, while those receiving the other forms of treatment remembered an average of 1.9, amounting to a 10% improvement. It is also important to point out that throughout these experiments, this team of researchers used an EEG to monitor the brain activity of the patients as well. And the results of the EEG did show changes consistent with improved memory. Of course, there is a lot more research that needs to be done to show how TPBM can improve brain functions. But this team is hopeful that this type of technology could provide non-invasive treatment for a wide variety of brain disorders. Study author Ole Jensen says this about the future of TPBM. We need further research to understand exactly why the TPBM is having this positive effect. But it is possible that the light is stimulating the mitochondria, the power plants, in the nerve cells within the prefrontal cortex. And this has a positive effect on the cell's efficiency. We will also be investigating how long the effects might last. Clearly, if these experiments lead to a clinical intervention, we will need to see long-lasting benefits. Super cool, right? So if you want to check out even more information about this stimulating study, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the YouTube description for this week's episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or, heck, you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of July 14th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton. 
and you've been fried.